Think of Assam and images of the mighty river Brahmaputra, the beautiful tea gardens and of course the formidable Indian rhino come to mind. Located in Northeast India, the state is endowed with a rich natural heritage. Assam is home to approximately 2,500 rhinos but 90% of these are concentrated in one protected area alone. Kaziranga National Park To expand their distribution range and to reduce risks like disease, loss of genetic vigor due to inbreeding and mass mortality associated with such a concentrated population, the Indian Rhino Vision 2020 or IRV 2020 was developed. The IRV 2020 is a joint program of the Department of Environment and Forests, Government of Assam, WWF India and the International Rhino Foundation with support from the Bodoland Territorial Council, US Fish and Wildlife Service and local organizations and communities. Hello and welcome to another episode on Planet Outlook. Today is also World Rhino Day and we have two special guests with us, the additional director general of forest and wildlife, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, Numitur Rasgupta, and Dr. Dipankar Ghosh, who's the director of species and landscapes program in WWF. Thank you for joining us on Planet Outlook, both to Mr. Dasgupta and Dr. Ghosh. Thank you. So I'll begin with uh, coming to you, Mr. Dasgupta. The Indian Rhino Vision uh, 2020 just came to an end earlier this year. You have driven kind of this project, kind of a, a major majority, a major part of this uh, kind of pro project, and it's it's been a success story kind of thing. So if you can just for the viewers' sake, it's a very general audience that's listening to us. If you can just briefly take us through the journey. Okay. First of all, I must uh, thank. Uh, Mr. Banerjee for having me in the show. And uh, secondly, I would be also thanking uh, my good friend, Dr. Dipanka Ghosh, who is also here today uh, for the meeting. Uh, rhinoceros is one such species which do not get the attention like uh, elephant and uh, lion and tiger. So it was uh, pretty good uh, that we got something in place for uh, the conservation efforts to be you know, synchronized for our species, which uh, uh, des deserve much more attention. And that is why a number of objectives were laid out for rhinoceros conservation. And uh, we have seen in our own eyes that uh, various objectives like the numbers, which is you know, one of the major uh, component of uh, success, you can say, has increased uh, as far as rhino is concerned. Uh, the rhino states, the officials, the people, because without people, you won't be able to conserve these days. We have to have the people along uh, with you to conserve any species. They are more educated, more aware of rhino conservation. And we have also seen that the ministry and other organization are uh, more concerned for this particular species and have been funding uh, if not adequately, but at least to a great extent, much larger extent what we used to see earlier. And uh, which actually led us to, you know, uh, you know making certain plans for uh, bringing in uh, better technology for uh, rhino conservation. Rhodes uh, is one such technology, a DNA, a DNA indexation uh, method, uh, which has uh, been introduced for rhinoceros in India with the help of WII. Uh, we have also held meetings, uh, you know, with the rhino countries here in India, and that led to the New Delhi Declaration, which has objectivized many, many issues, which was perhaps required uh, for not only India, even for the countries where rhino is found. And uh, India is actually spearheading, I uh, would like to say, that uh, rhino conservation, as, especially in the uh, Asian and Southeast Asian context. And uh, in the country also, you know, um, the objectives that those were laid out for rhino conservations have uh, by and large been met. 
Uh, we are also uh, thinking of uh, introducing rhino in its older habitat, it means exploring newer areas where rhino once existed. And uh, nowadays you won't find that. So if, uh, or in case of Assam, in case of Bengal, even in case of Uttar Pradesh, we have proposed for a reintroduction of rhinoceros, so to say, in these three states, we identified areas, we have pumped in fund from the ministry. And uh, as far as I understand from the feedback that I get, things are in place and moving in the right direction. We also had a, a policy uh, as a part of the action plan of uh, you know, opening up newer areas for rhino conservation. And uh, that is also happening That's in Bihar, in Balmik Tiger Reserve, although it's a tiger reserve, but that is also one such area where we have rhino uh, coming from Nepal and finding its place for a much longer time. And we can say that these are sometimes can be, uh, you know, uh, um, termed as uh, Balmik rhinoceros. So uh, the government of Bihar is also playing an important role in actually uh, delineating this area also, not only as a tiger reserve, but also as a rhino area. So all in all, I would say the picture is looking very bright and we are very hopeful because all concerned uh, people who are associated with rhino conservation are in place and they are all together for rhino conservation uh, internationally as well as in India. Yes, you are saying something. Yeah, so what's the big news today? If, if there's a big announcement today you want to make on World Rhino Day, what would be that? The one thing that I would like to say is uh, as per the New Delhi Declaration, you know, uh, to secure the future on Asian rhinos. We had a, uh, you know, head banging session. We had large number of uh, participants from different countries. We also invited uh, the South African counterparts. They were also here. And one of the major area that was discussed amongst many others and finalized as a New Delhi Declaration is to strengthen the transboundary cooperation uh, between the rhino range countries. And India has got common boundary with a good number of uh, uh, countries who are harboring rhino and there are regular movement of rhino. So I'm very glad to say that uh, we initiated, uh, just to further the cause, uh, we initiated a draft memorandum of understanding between uh, India and Nepal, because Nepal is one such country where there are lots of movement of rhinoceros and there are many issues, those needs to be sorted out. And uh, the MOU has uh, been agreed upon and uh, by both the countries, uh, the draft MOU have been uh, approved. Now we are moving a cabinet note for its final approval. So when the, when the cabinet note comes through, so it's going to be a breakthrough for uh, a wild animal conservation and transboundary protected areas, which perhaps is hard to be found in any other parts of the world, except a few in uh, Africa and one or two in Europe, but none in Asia. So this is one big thing that is going to happen uh, rather in the offing in the very near future. So that's, I, I think, the best possible um, way to celebrate rhino conservation, yeah. Also, I noticed I was looking at the figures. So we had a 50% jump. If, if I take the figures from 2005 and six, when the, the Indian Rhino Vision kind of kick-started. And that time the target was to reach the 3000 goal. And we are around that 3000 goal today or have reached it. So are we bucking the trend of the sixth mass extinction, which is playing out as we speak across the planet? Because even uh, I'll come to you, uh, Deepankar, but even the Living Planet Report, which WWF brings out, say the 60 to 70 percent drop in species across the world. And here with our efforts in conservation in India's efforts, not only rhino, obviously there's, the tiger has also gone up. So are we somewhere also bucking the trend and we are kind of uh, putting up an example to the world? You are directing the question to me, Mr. Banerjee? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah First yeah, to yeah. you and then I'll go to you. Okay, okay. And this is a question which I really relish and because I'm fiercely patriotic and I believe that what India has done, uh, no other country has really done it, okay? 
So uh, we have, uh, you know, outlined this in the uh, various conventions meeting that we attend, and even in the Gandhinagar COP of CMS, we outlined this, and we had showcased to the entire world as to we will not only speak, but what we are doing, because we had put up a pavilion where all the state governments participated and actually they exhibited their wares, what they are doing, Karnataka, Gujarat, Bengal, so on and so forth. And everybody has had come up with some examples which perhaps have not been seen by the entire world. So this is one thing, not only the number of animals, you know, there are so many first that we uh, actually, uh, you know, do and the world perhaps may follow. Even, uh, you know, a country like a developing country like India, which is an aspirational country, uh, we need to have development. We also need to have uh, conservation. So the linear infrastructure policy that have been put in place was also appreciated by all and sundry. And everybody wanted to emulate that, you know, at least the developing countries in the CMS COP we had discussed and they have also included this as a part of resolution. So yeah, you know, we, we have shown our way with so much of population and such less land when you compare with the entire world landscape and so much of cattle population, the forest, you see overall forest is rising. The protected area is also rising. The number of animals are also rising. For the last few decades, you know, all the animals, all major animals have increased. And this is, this may be, you know, uh, you know, it may be uh, against the trend what is happening internationally, but it's totally different here in India. There's only one species which we can say that we unfortunately lost. That also way back, you know, in 50s or maybe late 40s, the cheetah. And other than this, all the animals are on the increasing trend and we are hopeful to bring back cheetah also very soon, okay? And lastly, I would say there are only few countries who actually can proudly say they have got a, a wildlife law. No, there are very few countries. And India is one such country who can boast of, of having a wildlife law. And law is nothing if it is not implemented. India after 72, you know, wildlife conservation, you have seen the change from free killing of animals and, and how the people now conserve the animals. So these are all examples which are perhaps to be emulated by the rest of the world. And this is, I would say that we should be, not only me, everybody, all of you rather should be proud of. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. Dipankar, what's your take on that? Because the Living Planet report, which WWF brings out, basically is ticks. And every couple of years, we see a negative trend. And here, the Rhino program kind of thing, which you have been part of from the very inception, I remember the 2005, 2006 years, then under the leadership of the late PK Sen and Tariq Aziz. And I was also um, did some communication work for you. So how has been the journey? And Ananda, there are two things in it. The Living Planet Report is a global report that looks at indices. And what WWF is promoting, along with other research institutions, and most importantly, government partners, local communities, civil society organizations, is let's try to bend the curve. The curve is going downward, and we need to bend it at some point of time. That was the thought, the whole idea of Indian Rhino Vision 2020 rehabilitation, translocation of rhinos came with this premise. When we started IRV 2020, it was primarily focusing at the state of Assam. If you take a look at the vision, it says that by 2020, Assam should host or should have 3000 rhinos in the wild. But what sometimes we forget is that it also said that there should be rhinos distributed in seven protected areas of Assam. When we started, rhinos were there in three protected areas, Kaziranga, Orang, and Pobitura with, with very high densities. And we thought that we would be able to bring rhinos back to Manas, Laukwa, Burasapuri, and Dibri Soikwa. There has been tremendous support from the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change Government of India, the Assam State Forest Department, the government of Assam, the Borderland Territorial Council, 
International Rhino Foundation, then US Fish and Wildlife Service, and above all, the local communities in the rhino bearing areas. The people in Manas initially were saying, okay, rhino will come. Will they come and start grazing uh, in the crop fields? I said, well, it might happen, but then we will put in measures. So electric fencing, solar powered fencing was put up. When rhinos were being taken from Pobitura to Manas, I remember a group of ladies at one point of time were saying, they were asking questions. They said, why are you taking rhinos to Manas? There were rhinos, rhinos are not there. So we had to tell them and students, we had to tell them. And primarily it was the, it was the state government and the officers. Uh, there's one very uh, senior officer, uh, Mr. DM Singh, who is no more, uh, but there were other officers, including uh, some of the present officers uh, there. Uh, they were saying that, look, we need to start this program and we need to expand the distribution. We cannot put all eggs in one basket. We need to increase it. 20 wild to wild rhinos were translocated to Manas. Uh, a partner organization, Wildlife Trust of India, they had uh, translocated rhinos from uh, the rescue center from CWRC in Kaziranga. And Manas now has a breeding population. So somewhere in Manas, bending the carve has already started. I think in addition to the numbers that you are saying, the whole point that the ADG, uh, Mr. Dasgupta has been saying is that it's not just the numbers, you give them protection, they will breed, but our vision is to increase the distribution. If you look at the historical range of rhinos, unicorns, and what we see the indicators of the grasslands, you'd see that rhinos were once distributed from the floodplains of Indus River to Ganges floodplains and Brahmaputra floodplains. Like a huge distribution running into thousands of square kilometers. Now they are in eight protected areas. Very small numbers in Valmiki, which come from Chitwan, and good populations in Assam in, in four protected areas, which I have mentioned, two in West Bengal and Dudhua. What has already started under the ambit of this whole national rhino conservation plan and the state plans is that creating populations within the states. So Dudhua, which had for the last 30, 40 years, one captive population that has been split into two, not, a, not like equal split, but a small population, which is also in captivity, then the vision is to bring them into the wild and uh, remove them from, from the captivity and from uh, within the Boma is already there. So that there is, there should be a wild population in, in Dudua and Dudua has got gross, good grasslands. And as uh, Edigi sir has also been vouching is that we also need to look at grassland conservation and rhinos are the indicators. These are the indicators of good grassland conservation and grassland management. Some protected areas have done stellar work in grassland management, shifting from the traditional, okay, burn grasslands every year so that rhinos or other herbivores will be able to feed on shoots, tender shoots every year. There are There is now a science-driven approach to this entire grassland management. NTCA has also started this process. And I think it's there is convergence happening there because good grassland means good herbivores and not only rhinos, it will also help in other large mammal conservation. It will help in tiger conservation. Good herbivores mean also and good protection will also mean good tiger conservation. So ultimately, there is a convergence happening and India is leading from the front when we are coming to large mammal conservation, if we say in, in Asia. So I want to ask you, in, in Assam, the Manas is a real success story. I mean, I've been into Manas when it was coming out from its bad days. And I went back after 10 years recently, a couple of years back, and I've seen the change kind of noticed. But there were other plans in Assam for you also to, to <clears throat> translocate, to introduce the rhino. That didn't happen. So, so, so what were the challenges? What happened there? So two things. One is that it needs focused engagement and it also needs a lot of resources. So Manas, we have been able to do that. And because the focus of all of us, including the government agencies, including whether it's a central government agency or uh, the state government, it worked very well in Manas. And maybe one of the reasons is that Manas is a tiger reserve. So the funds which go from Project Tiger and, and Manas, there is, there is already a focused conservation approach. We started in Buddha Sapori. Uh, things started off well. Uh, we translocated to rhinos, uh, they didn't survive, but the plan is already there. I think if we have more resources, and when I say resources, it's, it's not just money, it's also human resources, it's also engagement, because serious engagement needs to be done with the local communities, 
the frontline staff of the forest department, their capacities need to be built. It's whether it is about monitoring radio colored rhinos, whether it is about working with the local people on awareness generation, whether it's a participatory conservation approach, empowering the local people, it, it needs a lot of time and efforts. So now Manas is there, you know, the focus is in Manas without reducing much focus from Manas. The plan is that in Assam, we will focus in Burasapuri. We will focus in that Laukha Burasapuri complex and see what's happening. And the state government is working towards that. And together with the MOEFCC, whatever support is required uh, that we are getting and whatever is within the ambit and scope of work from WWF and our partner organizations, we'll try and do that. So mm, these are great stories to hear, but uh, this, this is my question to both of you now. Things on the ground, especially on the Aino, can change very quickly because there's a huge poaching threat. <laughs> the international, uh, the illegal trade and, uh, has always the eyes on both in Africa and India. How secure are we with our population? Mr. Dasgupta, if you can go first. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, the situation has improved drastically. If you see, if you uh, compare the data and the statistics for the last uh, 10 years, you will see uh, the numbers have come down, especially in Assam. Although there have been some sporadic cases of uh, rhino poaching, but things are more or less under control, especially so because, again, India is one such country who uh, have initiated for constitution of a crime control bureau, a dedicated wildlife crime control bureau. And uh, these offices have now been activated fully uh, to actually exercise all the powers that have been entrusted upon them. And secondly, uh, uh, I would also like to add here that uh, there is one more uh, international uh, you know, law enforcement agency that have been constituted. We call it as SAWEN, S-A-W-E-N, that is South Asia Wildlife Enforcement Net Network. And this is having its headquarter in uh, uh, Nepal, Kathmandu, and many you know, rhino bearing states are members of it. So, you know, the information, the intelligence, they are sharing with each other and uh, things are more or less under control. And uh, I would say, although, you know, in a country as vast as India, there will be sporadic cases. But again, the catch here is to uh, have the people at large uh, to be associated with any kind of conservation process. And uh, for multifarious reason, one such reason is, you know, intelligence gathering and control of wildlife crime, control of uh, rhino poaching, et cetera. And this, I think, again, India is playing a lead role and uh, they are pretty successful in this regard. Of course, uh, you can't make it 100%, uh, you know, uh, immune or, or you can't stay 100% immune from the uh, nefarious activities from the smugglers. But at the same time, if you compare the situation here in India, or the neighboring countries with Asia, uh, with the Africa, you will find there's a lot of difference. So things are more or less under control, but still we should be on guard. We should not be letting uh, low our guard. We have to be very careful. And uh, we need to continue with the pressure that we have kept up through our Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, as well as through the state governments. They need to also play an important role and hopefully things will be improving even more in the future. So, Anandu, uh, in addition yeah. to what uh, Adiji sir has said, there are two aspects. One is, which sometimes we don't recognize or we don't see, is tremendous political will at the state and central level. When rhinos poaching happened, and a few years back when poaching was, was, was going up, I remember that the chief minister of Assam, he had camped in Kaziranga, did meetings and said that, look, we need support from people. It's not just about strengthening protection, which Dasgupta sir is saying, but also support of local people. If you look at the flood management in Assam for the last few years, what I have seen is that the chief minister himself, in fact, the previous chief minister and the present chief minister, I've seen that, of course, on, on television, that they were on the occasion talking to the development commissioners, talking to the park director, involving police, involving uh, elected representative, 
jobs to ensure that rhinos and other animals get a safe passage when the park is flooded and they need to move towards the southern areas towards the hills of karbi anglong that's something we need to recognize both at the state level and at the national level rhino is the state animal of assam and people take a lot of pride so that needs to be celebrated and and government successive governments have been able to hold that banner very high second is this use of technology and the use of different models what sir has said is about wildlife crime control bureau but also rodis so rodis or rhino dna indexing system them which is a project which we uh, developed in collaboration with MOEFCC the states and wildlife institute of india and the concept came from the veterinary genetics laboratory of the university of pretoria is mapping rhino dnas so whenever a rhino horn is seized from an offender then one can actually map to see that which population it has come from and that helps in investigation that helps in closing the case there has been recent cases two cases where the source has been identified and cases has been taken to a logical conclusion so use of technology is very important for that and all these will ultimately help in again convergence support from the politicians support of local people with closure of cases you know when people see that look there is some visible impact happening then there will be more support and now we are living in a virtual world youth of today are talking on phone maybe more than what we did 20 years back they are always on phone and that's technology good, so good, good you mentioned and i want to take that political uh, and i also we're running out of time and i want to end in end with a, another question you mentioned grasslands and the political will and um, grasslands are also contested spaces and i i'm just repeating i think my connection is going off so Uh, grassland is a contested space now and rhino needs grasslands and many other species along with the rhino needs uh, so edg dasgupta how hopeful are you to we can extend the grassland habitats and we can secure because grasslands are not uh, generally seen as in the forest uh, kind of in the idea of forest landscapes and grassland grasslands has always been treated as wastelands in this country yeah grasslands are uh, presence or the success of rhino is integrally associated with conservation of grassland and uh, they are you know the indicator of a very good grassland if the population is optimal in a particular area and uh, i have already told you that uh, we are uh, thinking and already have started uh, reintroduction of uh, rhinoceros in newer areas not only in assam but in bengal in uh, bihar as well as in uttar pradesh so naturally it entails uh, you know conservation creation and conservation of more grassland and uh, that will happen especially in these rhino habitats but grassland is also a very important aspect if you specifically ask so uh, uh, why we should be conserving grassland where the government of india is really caring about it i would say grassland is a very important subject and the government of india is say, very serious about it not only for the mega fauna but also for even birds you know and we are conserving for terrestrial birds uh we are have already proposed new areas for uh, conservation of uh, the birds and conservation of the grassland and as dipankar was also indicating that uh, you know grassland will be not only serving the purpose uh, for the species directly like rhinoceros birds who are totally dependent on grassland but it will also indirectly help a larger carnivores like uh, you know uh, leopard uh, the tiger because ultimately their food base would be the uh, deer and other you know population who are more uh, dependent on the grassland so their success of a carnivore uh, in the a particular ecosystem will be totally dependent on the the number or the richness of the grassland so grassland as such is a very important aspect both direct and indirectly and uh, we are very concerned about it and we are taking steps so that grassland is conserved in such a manner so that not only uh, animals like uh, herbivorous animals like uh, you know elephant rhinoceros birds survive but at the same time indirectly the carnivores also survive so we are actually looking into this with uh, you know a matter of importance and priority So Dipankar do you have a similar program on your landscape 
to amplify the grassland agenda absolutely ananda we now have five broad strategies for the wildlife and habitats program of wwf uh, which we implement in the conservation landscapes in partnership with the government and uh, civil society one of the objectives is habitats of which grassland is one of the pillars we have already started documentation scientific analysis of grassland management and improving grassland management systems in, in the tarai adudwa is one of the pilot sites we have a full time grassland ecologist who is working with the park management and helping the park management implement the thoughts because what our idea is to create something which can then get into the management plan which can then get into the working plan and we can see some visible changes similarly grassland restoration work is also happening in manas again with the tiger reserve authorities there has been a discussion a few months back with bnhs that perhaps the government of india and das gupta sir has just talked about it about birds is that we might need to look at grassland restoration and reviving a finch by a population in hastinapur wildlife sanctuary uh, also need to look at grassland restoration from the point of view of barasinga of of swamp deer in the tarai and sub tarai belt areas so it is an important component of our landscape conservation and not just landscape but also there is uh, what we are saying that it's it's a mix of terrestrial and as well as aquatic areas you know you call it an aquatic scape or or a freshwater scape uh, so we are working in grasslands which is flowing in between both so you know whether you look at it from the from birds or herbivores or carnivores these are one of the most productive ecosystems we cannot ignore it and one more thing is that the national wildlife action plan also talks about it every component also talks about grasslands so i i see there is a will and there is A, a very strong way forward to restore grasslands, manage grasslands, and improve uh, their their productivity. Thank you. Thank you, Dipankar. Last words, Edi Ji Das Gupta. Your last words. We'll end it. This is World Rhino Day, and we'll end this program with your last words. Yeah, I I'm sure that uh, India will see more rhinos and more rhino areas uh, in the country very soon, and it will spearhead. uh you know rhino conservation at least in the southeast asia with its expertise with the help of uh, you know its friends like wwf and other organizations so picture is very uh, bright and we are very hopeful about it yeah any any messages particular messages you want to send out to states the four states that dipanka was mentioning the rhino states oh uh, yeah i would be only requesting the state governments to adhere to the commitment given by them uh, regarding rhino conservation and especially for finding the newer areas uh, which has also uh, come in today's discussion and uh, once uh, they decide that we should go ahead i think it will be easier for both the governments to come together and take up rhino conservation in the right direction thank you so much thank you thank you dipankar also it's been pleasure having you both on this show thank you sir thank you ananda thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you dipankar thank you. There will be further translocations undertaken under the IRV 2020 program which will ensure that the rhino populations of Assam spread across different protected areas continue to thrive in the years to come.